Welcome back on the AM show. Uh, we're grateful that you took the time to stay with us. I'm sure right about now you'd have been expecting me to share my blunt thoughts with you. It will come. But we're killing two birds with one stone. Yeah, we're going to try to do that. Uh, we're going to be discoursing on what former President Mahama was sharing with all of us uh, yesterday on the back of the economy. So what is happening to the economy? Uh, is it on life support like the president, the former president uh, paints the picture? And what is the way forward? Do we go the way of the IMF like he's proposing? Do we, uh, how do we bring about more fiscal discipline? And should we sack our finance minister, the minister for finance and economic planning, Ken Oforiata? The former president suggests it's just because of his last name, Oforiata, the compound name, that he's still at post. Well, uh, to join us, dilate on all of those uh, matters this morning, we have a former deputy minister of information, Felix Kwachi Ofosu, in the studio here with us. Thank you very much. Communications, I beg your pardon, Deputy Minister. Well, I was first uh, Deputy yeah. Minister for Information. So Before you. So, 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 yes. so, so, you, so you take both. I am. <laughs> but what we all know you for is communications. Yes, so. That was yeah. the, the latest position I held before. Yeah. yeah I mean, but thank you. Thank you for joining. Oh, it's always a pleasure. It's been a while. I don't remember the last time. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. It, it, um, it's been... I think I was here either earlier this year or late last year. Right. I do not right. recall exactly when, but we spoke about uh, emerging developments at the time. So it's a pleasure to be back. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, let's talk about the state of the economy. There's a whole lot to talk about, and former President Mahama has been digging mm -hmm. into exactly that. But let's set aside a bit what the former president says. If I asked you what is the state of the economy for you as a Ghanaian, forget all the positions you've held, uh, what would you say? Well, I think that uh, this is one question that almost everybody in Ghana can answer off the top of their heads. Even a child should be able to answer this because it is felt, it is palpable. You can cut through it with a knife. It is obvious that our economy is in shambles. Um, for many people, they use uh, micro indicators to assess the health of the economy. In other words, what you find on the market, how your pocket feels like, your ability to afford uh, basic necessi necessities of life, your ability to pay your bills. That is how they assess the health of the economy. And if we were to use that, it is quite obvious that the economy is in complete disarray. Uh, times are simply too hard. Um, we are at unprecedented levels with regards to fuel prices, mm. uh, rent, transportation prices, food prices. People can barely afford uh, one, one meal a day. And life is really, really hard for many, many people. Unemployment is on the this, this is what puts the, the economy in disarray? Oh, it, is, it is. I mean, because, because no. I mean, look, yeah. some of these things, they, they come and they go. No, it, but it's I don't not, think it's not a permanent I, situation. I don't do, think do, you remember, do you remember the time when uh, for, uh, now Vice President and, mm -hmm. you know, then mm -hmm. uh, standing with Nanado, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Mohamedou Baumia said, you know, nurses are suffering, teachers are suffering. I don't think that we've that. been anywhere near this. People were suffering in this country. Well, at well, that time, well, there has never been when your government was there in, has never in been office, a time where there has not been a, there has not been economic difficulties. It's the very nature of so, so that's exactly the point. No, I, but, uh, I, I will explain exactly what I mean. The very nature of our economy mm. has meant that since independence, there has always been difficulty because we've not been able to achieve the level of development economically that we would wish for. But in the last forty years, at least, everybody who has lived in this country and it's of age can testify that we've not had this sort of hardship before. That really is the crux of the issue. So we are not talking about regular economic problems stemming from our state of development, but we are talking about unprecedented levels of hardships stemming from serious economic decay and mismanagement. So we need to distinguish the two positions. It is true that Dr. Baumia made a song and a dance of the economic situation in 2016, but it was only for partisan gain. Um, on hindsight, we know that he was engaged in mere blaster. He didn't have any exceptional skill to turn anything around. And in fact, he has worsened the situation that he met. So the economy is in very terrible shape. Everybody feels it. There's no dispute. There's unanimity. Government itself is not able to say that things are better than they took over. So I don't think that there's any need to haggle over what the reality is. But what is more worrying, my brother, is that this government does not appear to have any plan to address the problem. It is one thing to have the problem. And then it's another to see concrete efforts, clear efforts aimed at addressing it so that all of us can come out of this mess. There does not appear to be any plan. 
there's complete nonchalance. There, there, it's like the, the, we have, the economy we have, hasn't collapsed. We've not witnessed well, but, what has but, happened but, but, but what in, we in have, Sri Lanka or, or Syria well, or some we other. Are not, we are not very know, far country. away. We are not very far away from what is happening in Sri Lanka. What, what makes indeed, you say that? Indeed, is it because I read, of the, the state of I read, our reports, I read a report only yesterday. You know, mm. the IMF's chief economist, mm. who is also a professor of economics at Harvard, said that there are a number of countries that will be going the Sri Lankan way in a matter of months if corrective measures are not taken. He mentioned Laos. Ghana was mentioned. Mm. And then... I mean, if you followed uh, uh, Steve Hanks of, yes, of, of yes. the Johns Hopkins exactly. University, exactly. And he's been the last time he po posted anything, as far as our currency was concerned, mm. just to make the... He, mm. he referred to it as a junk currency. Absolutely. One of the, so, but, 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 I mean, no, all of the, these are still not the, enough to say that. We are on the verge that. of collapse. There's no mm. dispute about it. Indeed, let me give you a few, a few figures to buttress my point. You see... Since the beginning of last year, right after the elections, because of election-related expenditure, we had what we call fiscal slippages. In other words, we have simply lived beyond our means. So we had incurred a, a huge deficit and quite some sizable debts. So you find that our fiscal deficit was higher than expected, and all indicators were pointing south. And then we have a problem with our public debt, which is so big that what it takes to service it is simply strangulating us. So, for instance, take this year. You know, if you look at the budget, the government said the that... Public debt and the public debt and yeah. compensations, of yeah. course. If you, look at, if you look at the public... Uh, sorry, the, the budget for 2022. This government said that for the first quarter of this year, between January and March, they were expected, expecting to raise 14.6 billion Ghana cities in tax, tax revenue. At the end of the quarter, they were able to raise 12.8 billion Ghana cities. Now, even if we were to overlook the difference... We paid for debt service to the tune of 13.9 billion. In other words, all the money that was collected for the first quarter of this year was not enough to pay for debt services. So government had to borrow in excess in order to be able to service our debt. So, so we basically borrowed to pay, to pay to another pay. borrower. Exactly. And we are, we are not even paying the, all the principal. We're paying interest and then a bit of the principal. Mm. Mind you, compensation has not come. Statutory payments are not, has not come, and other payments. Now, because of this, government ha barely has money to do anything else. If you look at the same budget, 2022, they said the first quarter of this year, they were going to pay 1.3 billion Ghana cities to contractors who they owed. They were only able to pay 38 million Ghana right. cities. Again, they said they would clear other arrears to the tune of 285 million. They could not pay a dime, so not even one city was released because government did not have the money. Now look at the agri sector. I want to illustrate the impact that is having on our country. Look at the agri sector. You know that since 2020, this government has owed to the tune of 485 million Ghana cities to fertilizer suppliers. Right. Indeed, there's one company called Idisa. Yeah. They supply the northern part of this country with fertilizer. For, I think for, it's over 200 million. Over 200 million. How is it supposed to survive? Mm. The business is collapsing. Seed suppliers are also owed 205 million Ghana cities. They cannot pay school feeding caterers. Contractors are owed over 8 billion Ghana cities. Indeed, for three straight years, they've not been able to print textbooks for basic school pupils. Leap, leap beneficiaries. Indeed, we had to get a bailout of 40 million Ghana cities from the World Bank about two months ago before we could pay leap beneficiaries who are the lowest of the low in our country in terms of economic capacity mm. and who depend but, but on But again, I, I'll, I'll just point to you the fact that while you mention all of these, these are not things that are new. But these are not new. things that are new in terms of owing. I mean, yesterday, no, for example, but I, was, I, was, I, was, I was interacting with the leadership of the GHA, the Ghana Highways Authority, sure. the National Road Safety Authority. You know, now the medians. I mean, mm -hmm. on the back of that story, we see in today's daily graphic that medians are going to be cleared and all of that. Mm -hmm. These are all contracts. At some point, government owes. Yes. Whether, whether it is the buffer. Of course, of course it has never... Uh, company or whatever. I do not know of any... You always owe to some extent. I do not know of any... What, what makes this different? What makes it different is the gravity. The gravity. The gravity of it. So the amount of debt. The amount of debt is simply mind-boggling. Mm. Indeed, in Cocoa Board alone, we hear that they owe about 30 billion Ghana cities. The state-owned enterprises put together have over 20 billion Ghana cities on their books. Mm. And these are monies that have not even been added to our public debt. Look at the inflation rate. It's 27.6%. This is the highest in the sub... Sorry, the West African sub-region. Mm. If you look at budgets... Sorry, government's own budget statement again. In the first quarter, they projected that they will make a deficit of 2.2. They made 2.6. Mm. 
So they've slipped by 0.4 percentage points. And marginal. we expect... Marginal. It's not marginal. marginal. Now, if you, if, we are, if you analyze it, mm. we are talking in essence of 10% deficit. And when you have a deficit that is above 10%, no, that but, is serious but, but, but we are not analyzing no, it. No, but it, it, it shows a trend. And because the, you see, the point I'm trying no, to make is because that it does are, not necessarily no, indicate no, that no. at the end of because they the have, year, because they have, because they have, they have slipped here, they have to make up mm. in the in the previous previous quarter, in the next quarter, mm. and in a bid to do that, they will slip further. Again, look at our debt to GDP ratio, for instance. It's over eighty percent. Mm. Our public debt is now in excess of four hundred billion. Again, look at our currency. Do you know why our currency is depreciating? Tell me. It is because. Non-resident holders of our bonds are pulling out like crazy. Non-resident holders of our what? What happens is that when you float bonds on the domestic market, there mm. are people who do not live in Ghana but buy some. Definitely. They buy that in dollars. So it also helps to show up our reserves. Mm. Do you know that the, the share of bonds held by non-resident uh, what do you call it? Investors has dropped from 35% to 15%. Uh, what and in the last one year, look, what accounts for that? Because they don't have confidence in our economy. They they fear that government may default. In the last one year alone, our reserves has dwindled by $1.7 billion. Mm. And that is what is putting pressure on our local currency, and it keeps on depreciating. And as we speak, it has stopped eight cities to a dollar in many, many forest bureaus and other forest When I checked yesterday, 8.10. But defaulting, Absolutely. defaulting isn't, isn't Absol no. it's not a death sentence. Even Russia is defaulting. But you cannot, is For it, the first time since grave, 1918. They are grave. Is Even it, Russia is, is defaulting. It, we, we, must, we must distinguish between the fortunes of countries that are developed. Mm. We are not in the league of Russia. or the, And I hear people say, oh, yes, the UK owes, mm. the US owes. You no, know I what? have my own take on that. You know, I know. Because you see, the, you see, the, when they borrow, the, the quantum of, of... No, it's not even the quantum even of borrowing. It's when borrowing they borrow. When and they, the percentage. I know. No, when they borrow. They borrow at under one percent, and that's what I'm saying. The percentage so at which they they, they use rate. only a fraction of their revenue to service them. So they have so much money to spend on other things, such that they are even able to extend some to us as aid. Mm -hmm. We cannot get enough to even pay for interest payments alone in the first quarter of this. And that is what is so how do you compare that, 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 that is what yeah. is complicating yeah. the situation for us because we are getting what four percent upwards and no. all of that. And no. I mean, I mean, uh, on, looking now, at the lowest rate. Now, our bonds, yes. our bonds are they, at over 20% on the domestic front. Yes. Our international bonds. It, it depends on where we are going. No. Our international bonds also sell for uh, above 20%. Mm. Uh, we borrow at 7% for commercial loans. You mm. know, the recent syndicated loan that President Mama spoke about. Mm. The, interest, the 1 billion. Yes, the interest is 7.29%. That mm. means that it will cost us mm. 438 million. Right. I've heard the one billion. that. So, clearly, we are in trouble. And what worries me the most is the lack of a plan to address this. You see, but you say the lack of a plan. You yes, there's a clear lack of a plan. There's a clear lack of a plan. But the economy isn't on autopilot, else we wouldn't even be here. Look no. at what is happening in Sri Lanka. Yes, but, else we wouldn't and, and, even be here. Absolutely. But, but, but at the same time, you know, it's curious because the, the, the ruling you know, administration, the MPP, our government, mm -hmm. has tried to push through the e levy, they've tried different mechanisms, and your side in Parliament was the same and because cobbling them, because you know, fettering them, preventing them from, because we knew. from getting that. Because we knew that those prescriptions were not going to address the problem. But they were going you to were help. No? They were going to it help alleviate going to the, the, the First situation. Of all, they, were, they were hedging their fortunes you know, on unpredictable behavior. There was no certainty about how much you were going to get from e -Levy. Was there any certainty when that was going to be yes, passed? Yes, because... Was there certainty? Yes, there was certainty to extend that whether you like it or not, in the course of the day, you are going to have to buy something to eat, drink. Any service that you procure in the course of the day attracts VAT. So there was some level of certainty. And that is how come today VAT is contributing in excess of 20 billion Ghana cities to our tax revenue. But the same cannot be said about Momo. You can decide that rather than send Momo, you call wherever you want to send it to to come for the money. And as people are doing now, they are finding innovative ways to sidestep the system. So you could not predict that. But the point that we made when they introduced the E-Levy discussion, was that it was not going to be the panacea. Mm. Apart from the uncertainty and unpredictability, even if you had that six billion and added it to your revenue, it was still not going to get you out of the mess because it did not address the problem. You see, the problem we have, and as President Mama indicated yesterday, is not that we don't have enough to spend. The problem we have is that whatever we get is being swallowed by, by debt unsustainable service. debt service. Mm. So in order to address the problem, you don't pile on taxes and keep on increasing the suffering of your people. Mm. You address the debt. Now, how do you address it? There's been talk of IMF program. You see, the IMF program must be clarified. 
And it is important that we remove these <coughs> misconceptions. The MBB itself demonized the IMF. But the IMF, they are not demons. They don't have horns and tails. You know? They are not holding a pitchfork. What they simply do is to insist that you comply with the tenets of fiscal discipline. Basically, you don't live outside your means. So some you economists have told us that we're already no. meeting some of those targets. No, it's not we're true. It's not, first of all, we don't even have It's them. not going to change much no. when we go no. to the no. IMF. No. Though, though I agree that, that there will instill more fiscal is discipline. First of all, and when you know there's a big brother watching you, yes. to and, whom and, you are accountable, and, and issue, there are certain things you there's want. There's an issue of the balance of, payments of, uh, balance of payment support that they will give you, which come at very concessionary rates. So you can show up your reserves. Um, your, your currency what you would have had to yes, pay, your currency would you get to stabilize. save on that and, and then stabilize you pay account. minimal costs. But fiscal discipline and fiscal consolidation, which simply means that you align your expenditure with your revenue, is not sufficient to get us out of this mess because it does, not, it does not address the debt problem. What will address the debt problem is what President Rama spoke about. Debt restructuring. What that simply means. Is that you? That reminds me of structural adjustment. Yeah, no, well, it, that one was with, uh, to do. With no, I know. <laughs> now, what that simply means is that you can get your interest payments deferred. So you say, okay, within two or three years or five years, I'm not in a position to pay my interest to the full extent that I should. So give me a haircut. First of all, reduce the interest and then defer it for me. Let me start paying you in five years. What they will do is that they will simply add what you should have paid as interest to your debts, but then they will give you some space. So imagine that this year, for instance, we are supposed to pay about 50 billion Ghana cities in debt servicing. Imagine that we can even get 20 billion out of that as savings. Government will be able to pay fertilizer suppliers. Mm. Government will be able to pay school feeding caterers. Government will be able to pay contractors. They will be able to print textbooks, and then they will be able to invest in productive areas of the economy to create jobs for the youth. So an IMF program, which does not come with debt restructuring or some form of reprofiling of our debt, and getting some fiscal space from the deferment of our interest payments will not result in the kind of benefits that we derive as a country. But the problem is that this government has placed political posturing above pragmatism. My brother, they should have pursued an IMF program right after the elections because it was apparent then that we were in trouble. But they didn't you want to in do 2020. it. 2020. Let's say early 2021. Mm. Because after elections, uh, government had to be formed. So let's say by first quarter of 2021, they should have gone to the IMF. Egypt has gone to the IMF. But, but we are just no practically, we are just practically scraped out of an IMF program. It, but but well, then, wasn't it too yes, early? I mean, then, if, 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 if you if your party, the NDC, were in power, then would you have advised yeah. that they go back to the we, IMF we so, wouldn't, we wouldn't so quickly? Been, Lucy, we wouldn't have been in that mess in the first place because you need to check our numbers. In 2016, there was an election, but we did not spend beyond our means. We had a deficit of 6.1. Well, Indeed. at least I remember former President Mahama had made some promises about because we know in every electoral year there's huge oh, spending. Of course. He of had course. made some promises about trying to tone it down. Of Even course. that was a bit high, but it was of not course. like of course. it was not like unprecedented it was figures we have seen. First of all, you are allowed up to five percent. Mm. You are allowed that, but we made six point one, which is not too wide of the mark. Mm. So it was manageable, and that's how come we didn't have the kind of problems we have today. Indeed, as of twenty sixteen, we spent only ten point six billion servicing our debt which was less than 30% of our revenue. So there was fiscal space, and that's how come we could invest in various sectors of the economy. We did it, our debt to GDP ratio was under 57%. Our debt was just 120 billion. Today it's 400 billion. So we wouldn't have gotten into the situation that this government found itself in, in 2020 or 2021 after the elections. Mm. But then again, it is a scathing indictment on them that after all the gains that we made, do you know that when they came into power in 2017, they benefited from the larger chunk of the 939 million that the IMF was supposed to give us under the extended credit facility. We got about 300, it got 600. And then we managed to bring the fiscal situation under control. So all the indices were well aligned. And if they had managed things prudently, they should have built on the foundation that we've laid. It's not contrary to what the MPP, the picture that you painted when they came into office, the that you had left them, you the had left them a false. big indeed, mess. In indeed, fact, an, said, an economic abyss that they now had to fill. In fact, I remember all, the rhetoric attacks. that we now have to level up before we even think of building upon. You see, first of all, they inherited a relatively better, much better fiscal situation. Our deficit was not unsustainable. Our debt was not unsustainable. Um, they had some monies that they inherited. Indeed, they inherited $200 million in the sinking fund. Mm. There was money in the heritage Senator fund. Mentioned that in my there was money, there was $600 million in the heritage fund. They had some money uh, that we had set aside in the stabilization fund, which came in handy when COVID struck. So we left them, they had, there was money in the ESLA account. Mm. 
which they eventually went to securitize and get more loans up front. So what has happened is total mismanagement. And whilst they were at it, they were peddling falsehood after falsehood after falsehood. But at a point, these falsehoods catch up with you. Now look at... You, you, you talk about these falsehoods, but, but let's yeah. look at the gains supposedly we've made. Look, you can talk about 1D, 1F. You can talk about One Village, One Dam. You can talk about free SHS. You can talk about what they are doing, the LEAP program. There are so many flagship programs that we can speak of, uh, which they've given us, programs that you could not deliver, free SHS. But that is not true. You see, one of the other problems that we have is that this government believes too much in propaganda. You see, all their policies are driven by electoral gain. It is not, their policies are not designed. But if the policies are good and they are still... No, you no. Know, uh, you see, what they would are, you call them? They are, you see, policy... Populist. You see, you must be... <laughs> it it you doesn't know, matter. You must be far-sighted in policy making. You see, the, the programs that you, you, you churn out must resolve specific problems. You understand the point I'm making? The problems that you churn up must stand the test of time. They should be self-sustaining. Which of these programs are self-sustaining? None. They spoke about one village, one dam. Where are the dams? Indeed, was it even wise to promise a dam in every village in this country, in, in, every, in the northern part of this country? You didn't need a dam in every village in this uh, in, the, in the northern part of this country. But they promised it. But that's not, that, uh, that's not what the implementation means. It doesn't mean everyone what is going but that to is what is Indeed. But when you tell me one village, one, what does, what does it mean? What we needed were some quality dams that will address the problem of irrigation. Mm. But you don't engage in wholesale propaganda, parrot and sing slogans that have no meaning in terms of real benefit for the people. Again, you want to implement programs like free SHS. You do not guarantee sustainability. And in the end, you throw education into deeper mess than you met it. Now, the academic calendar has become so erratic that government itself is not able to communicate effectively with parents as to how the academic calendar will run. Today, they are not able to provide textbooks. Look at the situation where we have focused on SHS education. We say we are running free SHS, and yet we cannot print textbooks for people at basic school. Uh, the last time I read that they were spending about 38 million Ghana cities printing free SHS t-shirts. Meanwhile, you have not been able to print textbooks for basic school pupils. So there's clear misalignment, even in the education sector. Look at the situation with the tertiary uh, system. How lecturers continue to breathe down the neck of government for improvements in their conditions of service. Because those conditions are so poor that they are not adequately motivated to offer their best and ensure that there's quality education delivery at that level. So, you look at this uh, government, and every single program they churned out does not have sustainability inbuilt. Look at the school feeding program, for instance. It's a program started by President Kufo. We expanded it. Now look at the chaos in there. Mm. The women go and borrow money, they cook, and for years, they are not paid. How are they supposed to run? You have one... 97 pesos, and 90, they're calling for 90, three CDs, and exactly. they say even the three CDs will just make look, them break. 97 pesos make cannot, buy, cannot buy a bulb of onion today. So how can it even prepare a nutritious meal for a child? Look at planting for foods and jobs. You say you want to plant so that you get foods and you employ people. Yet, vital inputs like fertilizer and seeds are not being paid for. How do you owe to the tune of almost 700 million Ghana cities and purport to be running a successful program? So clearly, clearly, this government has got it wrong. They have programs with huge capital outlay that they do not know how to sustain. Again, when they are making policy, when they are making spending decisions, they do not factor in the need to be prudent. Look at what they did during COVID. You have COVID. And if you want to check how reckless they were, just compare us to our neighbors. All of them had COVID. But you see, when COVID struck, all governments that were prudent were minded to put in place measures to protect their citizens from the disease. So that was the first responsibility of government. This government ch chose, however, to do things outside of what was absolutely necessary because elections were coming and they wanted to create a feel good factor, an artificial feel good factor, so that they would get the votes. So right after the elections, they came to impose COVID tax and sanitation tax and all manner of taxes on people and increase the economic hardships that people were already going through. So it is imprudence, mismanagement, and poor policy choices that have driven us to the point that has brought us on our knees and we are gasping for so, breath, so, so, and so there's no solution. We're, we're gasping for economic breath. Yeah. Uh, former President Mahama, he's yeah. been there, he's done that. Sure. He had the Senchi consensus. Yes. And yes, uh, to your credit, you invited everyone to partake in it. He's, yes. he's calling for same to be done. Yes, it is, On the it back is of the fiscal deficit, the yawning yes. debt gap, the fact that we're bleeding even in terms of our foreign reserves, 
And so many factors are not working for yes. us currently. But um, what, what's the way out? I mean, I mean, because we all, it, it appears everyone is, almost everybody is leaning towards an IMF program now. Mm -hmm. But some have said that, you know, sends precautionary, uh, you know, messages that look, we've been there, we've done that. It doesn't solve any problem. Uh, what it, do you do in the, the interim? IMF. The euro bonds are not available to you. Yes. So what, what do you do to show up the economy? The IMF is what a what quick options fix. do we have apart is from it, the IMF? The IMF is a quick fix. Essentially, over the next three years or so, if they indeed go for a program, they will put in place some measures and strategies to ensure that we bring back stability to our fiscals, which is important. Once stability is brought, is brought back to the fiscals, investors that are stakeholders who deal with you in terms of foreign inputs, then we gain confidence in you. So they are able to open up their markets. For instance, if you have debt service obligations, you have maturing debt, and you don't have the foreign exchange to readily pay off, you can go to the Eurobond, raise some money, and do a rollover, or basically replace the debt, and then get an extended uh, what called maturity period, so that you have some breathing space. This government is not able to do that because since October last year, we've been shut out of the international market. Now, why have we been shut out? The investors have been taking a look at our books, and they are seeing that where we are heading to, it is not sustainable. They fear. Have our credit rating exactly. affected? They fear. Th this that they fear that if they lend us any more money, we will not be able to pay. And indeed, some of them are already withdrawing from our domestic bonds, and that's how come our city is plummeting. So the IMF program will provide an immediate sense of comfort and predictability for investors to deal with us. So you will find that we will gain access to the international bond markets. But as I have been reiterating all morning, the IMF program in itself will not be sufficient. And President Mama made a point yesterday. It will not be sufficient because we have a twin problem. When we went to the IMF, we had a problem convincing investors that we were doing the right things. So that's what the, led to the coining of the phrase policy credibility. In other words, investors were skeptical about the suitability or workability of the proposals that we had put on the table. We had actually put a number of proposals on the table to address the problems we were having. But they were skeptical because they know that we as a country have a history of always missing targets whenever we take our eyes off the ball. So once the IMF comes in, they know that the IMF will insist that things are done in a manner that will restore stability. Some say if we go the way of the IMF, one of the costs would be, you know, public sector axing of jobs or non recruitment Again, let me make this point. Let me make this all point. All of that. What is see, the reality of that? See, again, the, the MPP have become victims of their own falsehoods and propaganda. My brother, for the avoidance of doubt, there was no way in the IMF program of 2015 that they insisted that we do job cuts. Mm. What happened is that since 2008, no moratorium under the, being no, placed on since 2008, under the late Kodio Barredo as finance minister, government itself saw that there was a need to control the wage bill. And the way to control it is to ensure that people do not hire haphazardly and that people are hired on needs basis when there is vacancy. So a policy called net freeze, that means that people get employed when there is vacancy mm. in the public sector. It was introduced by the Kofua government. President Kufo was under an IMF program at the time. And it was one of the ways that they thought that they could manage our resources in a manner that does not get out of hand. So there's, there's actually a memo that I will share with you later, in which the finance minister at the time, the late Kodio Barredo, was admonishing all public sector agencies not to employ without recourse to his office. And that it was only when vacancies existed that people were to be employed. When we came into power, we made an exemption for education, that is teachers, health, nurses and doctors, and then the security agencies, they were not under net fees. But there was nowhere in the 2015 program that the IMF called for any job cuts. So I need to put that on the table. So that, 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 that point is clear. Before we yeah. go into more of what um, former President Mahama has been sure. saying, uh, just a quick thought, mm -hmm. now that you bring in Kufo. Sure. When you look at our uh, economic management under Kufo, which mm -hmm. your party criticized mm -hmm. vehemently, and you mm -hmm. look at now, Oh, I think that, look, I, I was a vehement critic of President Kufo. Indeed, in my formative years as a politician, I joined the civil society group, the Committee for Joint Action. And you recall that we staged all manner of protests across the length and breadth of this country. Because there, was, there were real hardships. At the burning time. issues. Right? There were burning issues. There were real hardships. There were difficulties. Indeed, I'm sure you recall. You spoke of the Kufo gallons nights, and all of those. There was one night that President Kufo had to address the nation on spiraling food prices and all that. And at the time that he was reading the script, we were scripting our responses. Mm. So that is how closely. When, when you look at the time of Kufo we, and, and how he is, managed uh, his team managed the economy he was and now. Pragmatic. He was pragmatic. When he Kufo came, was pragmatic. Yeah, when he came into power mm. and noticed that we had a difficulty with our debt and insustainability, he went hippic. So he actually got yes. 
we live to the tune of 5.3 billion right rice. almost so 6 when, billion exactly so when he left office our debt had been reduced considerably and that gave us some space for the government to invest in one sector or the other we also so that was good for you oh, of course it when was you good. inherited when the economy we in, after when, before. when we came in we we did even better and i must put it on record and the facts show that we brought in the most stable and prosperous period of economic management under the Fourth Republic. Our until, landless, until around 2014, and then things yes, started and then, and then things going started, haywire. Because of our cyclical tendency, you know, to respond to political pressures and then needs to satisfy certain constituencies. So we started having slippages, especially after the 2012 elections. We had a deficit of about 11%, mm. and that followed through to 2013 and 2014. Mm. But what we did is that we did not wait for the situation to deteriorate beyond salvation. We took immediate... You went to the measures. IMF. We did a century forum, out of which consensus was because you need to bring your citizens along. They must appreciate and understand why you are taking certain decisions. Mm. And then we went to the IMF. Look, when we went to the IMF, within a matter of months, we gained access to the international markets. So we were able to raise euro bonds to address some of our pressing commitments. And then you saw that stability quickly returned from a position of 11%. Indeed, by 2015, we had brought the deficit to 5%. And then in 2016, it went up to 6.1%. Our debt position started improving. Inflation came down from 19% in January 2016 to 15.4%. And it was on a downward trajectory. And that is what this government benefited from up to about 2018, 2019, thereabouts. So we did even better. Now, President Akufuado had the greatest opportunity amongst all those who had preceded him to do much better than anybody else. For one, he has received far more resources than all the other governments put, that came before him put together. He has received over 500 billion Ghana cities. The most that we had was 240 million Ghana cities. But he has received 500 billion. You he has 240 had, billion, not yes, million. Billion. Billion. That is what we did in eight years. In a matter of five years, he had received 500 billion. He has also enjoyed enormous goodwill from the people of Ghana. People have been very patient with him, up to a point where they saw that clearly. He was not taking us anywhere now. He was leading us to the path of ruin. Mm. Again, it does not appear to be in a hurry to address it. Look, there's been talk about dismissing the finance minister, for instance. In any self-respecting... Well, we would have gotten to that, but once yeah, we started, it just go in any, in any self-respecting mm. country, the finance minister himself would have resigned. Seeing the level of crisis that he has... We, we didn't see Seth Tepe resign on we the got, back we of got, the economic got, difficulties one, we were facing. One, we didn't see Seth Tepe resign. One, we got nowhere near where we are. That doesn't mean. And then two, he was prepared to listen and take corrective measures in time to save the economy. This finance minister has been obstinate. How many times has he not stood on platforms and dismissed the idea of going to the IMF? Meanwhile, everybody knows that it is one of the ways that we can achieve some immediate relief to address our problems. So if we have Again, to go, if we have to go the, the way of the IMF now, what, what, what picture does that paint? Well, you see, because of the propaganda they did, I'm sure there will be those in our society who criticize them and they will take the flag. But it is not avoidable. However, the larger interest of the country dictates that you take that step. But you see, our finance minister's position is so untenable. Look, he has a direct vested interest in borrowing. Last week, he was in parliament to answer some questions. I've heard a lot of you talk about it. Yes, let me explain it to you. Last week, he was in, answer, he was in parliament to answer a question asked by Honorable Teresa Winnie of Okankwe North. He was asked to indicate how much he has raised in bonds and how much transaction advices have made in terms of fees. His answer shows, and I'll forward the documents to you, that between 2017 and 2021, he had raised as much as 207 billion Ghana cities in bonds. His company, Data Bank, based on the figures he, his, he presented, has made over 150 million Ghana cities in transaction fees. There's no country in the world. Which is what percentage? Which no, is about 0.5%. 0 0 yes, but it is huge. Mm. If you raise 207 billion, 0. Point something percent of it is huge. And it comes to about 150 million when we do the calculation. Is that, no acceptable? is that acceptable? It is uh, not acceptable. To, uh, assuming, assuming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we don't have these figures, so we I'll cannot, send it to we, you. We cannot it corroborate to you. what you're saying I'll send it independently. It, we now, cannot do now that. Now it is public. But assuming, assuming this is correct, is that standard uh, practice in financial terms? First of all, I don't know of one country in this world where a finance minister will have such a direct vested interest in borrowing. In other words, the more he borrows, the more money he makes. So in a situation like that, 
the rational human being will borrow more so that his company, his company makes more. That is why you don't put yourself in that position. Are you suggesting maybe somehow intentionally the but first there's, minister there's has been borrowing there's a lot so that he, he, he will Let, line his pockets? Now, is that what you are, now, you are alleging? The US make that no, is that what you are alleging? The point I'm making is this. I'm stating a fact. Viewers can deduce from the facts I'm putting out whether or not what you are saying is the case. The more, you see, the money he makes is directly proportional to how much is borrowed. His company exists to make profits. And he is the beneficial owner of Data Bank. So ultimately, the profits will come to him as shareholder. Now, if you were in this position, will you borrow more or will you borrow less? That is why he must avoid But there are checks and balances. He can't no, just go no, and borrow away. No, there are no checks and balances. There are checks and he balances. Man, even, even, we may all, not necessarily have a ceiling when it comes to our debt to GDP all, listen, you know, portfolio, all, but there all, are all, checks and balances. There's no such checks and balances. All you need to do is inform parliament that you are going to borrow. Mm. He is the that, is, that is one of the checks is and he, balances. He, he is parliament man. is a check. Yes, but well, parliament will grant you the right to borrow because you may make a case for it. But you see, he's a man who makes the decision to borrow and how much you borrow. If he is making profit mm. from borrowing, it is a clear, unmistakable conflict of interest situation. There's no decent country in this world, not even the most craving banana republic, will tolerate this. And therefore, Mr. Foyata's company should never have been involved. You know that when he sends out notices, uh, notifying the market about the issuance of bonds, his company also receives those notices. It is not an acceptable situation. And therefore, it must come to an end. Apart from that, he has shown but, but if, it's, if, if it is not acceptable, as, as, acceptable. if it is as unacceptable, it's unacceptable as you paint the picture, it's unacceptable. Uh, how, how, how have we gone along with this for five years? What can we do about it? The only person who has the power to stop this is his cousin, the president. Even the idea that he's the president's cousin is problematic. It is problematic. But we know that. That I mean, is the this only is the reason. the first time that there are. Well, but that is the only reason. We had same my brother, President my Obama. The President Mama didn't have a cousin as finance minister. I'm not, I'm not saying cousin, yes. but relation. President, Ma, President Mama didn't have a cousin as finance minister. <laughs> there was a relation. <laughs> but the only, the only person who can reign in this finance minister and dismiss him is President Akufuado. Mm. He has not shown any inclination or any willingness to do that kind of thing. And we continue to go down this slippery slope, and our economy is on the verge of collapse. Perhaps they want us to get to the state of Sri Lanka before they take action. And I'm sure that if the Sri Lanka... The Sri Lanka state is, is, I mean, recently, my, my readings about Sri Lanka and the yeah. videos I've seen, yeah. I, I don't think we... I don't think no, we're we are there. Never, I don't think we're no. there. And it, it, it's not a place that my we brother, should, we My brother, to. yes. I mean, God forbid that we ever get there. Because when we get there, we will be in a real mess. But mm. you see, the things that led to the Sri Lankan situation are all over what is happening. You're saying the writing is on the wall. Yes, I, I referred you to the Harvard professor, who is the chief economist for the IMF. They group Ghana, Sri Lanka, Laos, and what have you in the same bracket as Sri Lanka. He says that, no, she says that there are other countries that will become like Sri Lanka in a matter of months, and Ghana is one of them. All right, two, two quick questions. Sure. Yeah. Aren't you being too hard, you together with your uh, flag bearer, the former president? Indeed, Muhammad, I would argue. Aren't, aren't you being too hard on Ken Oforiata and this administration, our government, because they have to deal with the twin problems of the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russo-Ukrainian war. We all know the impact across the world. That is one. And two, if you say they should, the government should sack, basically Mr. President should sack Ken Oforiata, what do you do? Don't you destabilize our economy? He knows better than anybody. Well, I would argue. The, the, the exact state see, of our economy. That, Bringing I, someone in at this point in time could just, you see, know, no. result in chaos. I would argue Two that, questions. So, so let's start with the, no, the twin problems. See, I would argue come to. that we have been very soft and tolerant of Mr. Foyata. I don't think that Ghanaians were this patient with the Mahama administration, which did not plunge us anywhere near the mess that we are in at the moment. So this president and his finance minister have exceeded tolerable limits. And then there's also the vice president, Baumia who is supposed to be the head of our economic management team, who is supervising this rot. People have been very tolerant of them. Indeed, if Ghanaians had been as demanding as they were of us, I don't think that things would have been like this. So the first point is that they cannot complain about criticism. Indeed, we have been very mild. President Mama has been very mild. If you read the script, he was very mild. And he even went on to prefer alternatives. When they were criticizing us, they claimed that because they were paying taxes, and we were the ones governing. They were not the ones to give us ideas. But we have gone ahead to give them ideas. That is the first point. So we have not been harsh. We have actually been very, very mild and accommodating of the finance minister, despite all the incompetence 
he has displayed. We have been accommodating of Dr. Bamiya, despite all the glaring incompetence he has displayed and the mess he has plunged us into. Now, in terms of the stream problem, you see my brother, the COVID and Ukrainian crisis have long been discredited as a reason why we are in this mess. It is true that the global economy suffered shocks from these two developments. But we are such an outlier that it cannot be because of COVID and the global developments that we are here. Our neighbors, West Africa, in West Africa, have similar economic characteristics as ours. Basically, we are almost like one people. Some of us speak the same languages. But the point is that they don't have the kind of deficit or debt or even inflation rates or currency depreciation that we are facing. Mm. So why is it that we are all affected by the same global developments? And yet our situation is so bad that we are gasping for breath and are unable to make any headway. We are unable to tell the tale from the head of the situation. But in those countries, they have been able to bring the situation under control. What is the inflation rate in Cote d'Ivoire? It's a single digit. It is a single digit. Nigeria has the highest, apart from that, yes, it's around 15%. We have almost 30%. Yeah, there's true. every indication, Last time I checked, there's every indication that we will cross the 30% threshold for inflation in the month in of the June. Next, right. In the month of June. Yeah, yeah, in the month, exactly. month of June. So, we've had so March, nobody, so. nobody can fault them. You see, what they, this government did, and I keep on referring to electoral advantage. You know that when they came to power, there was some difficulty with the banking sector. All they needed was 9 billion Ghana cities to bail out those banks so that they ran them well and returned them to profitability so that they can recoup their funds. But you see, when they saw that the banks were in trouble and they saw that the banks had 4.6 million customers, they immediately started counting votes. They collapsed the banks and then went to borrow 25 billion to pay 4.6 million people to create a feel-good factor for electoral advantage. So they saw votes where they should have seen reason and prudence. That is why we are here. And then the expenditure, look at the expenditure items that the, the, the finance minister went to recite in parliament. How do you spend almost $100 million on Veronica buckets and hand sanitizers for secondary school children? I mean, how much are those items sold for that you will need to cough up over six or almost 600 million Ghana cities in order to buy it? These clearly are inflated cost items, which have been foisted on the people of Ghana and have worsened our situation. But I think that we must accept as a people that the COVID and Ukrainian Russell war cannot become a reason why we are in this mess because all other countries have faced it. And yet their situation is not as terrible as ours. It is economic mismanagement. Oh. It is policy intransigence and unwillingness to listen and a certain pride, a certain belief in pedestrian propaganda, political posturing. That is why we are here. On, on the score of the E-Levy, yeah. what do we do with it? Do we scrap it? Do we maintain we it? We have said that we will, you see, they, no, yes, you have said in the yeah, past, but, yes, but, they, but you must face the reality of the time. No, yes, I, mean, they, I mean, even if we're going to the IMF, yesterday, the E-Levy would be something see, that we may need in our no, kitchen, yesterday, right? Yesterday, President Mama described it as the mother of all nuisance taxes. You see, a nuisance tax, basically, is a tax that imposes a burden on the citizenry, but does not yield much. Mm. The, projection and align, the projections and align the E-Levy were completely flawed. It does not appear that any serious thinking went into the decision to impose that levy because they could not predict consumer behavior. You think it was just uh, reaching out for low-hanging So what had happened was that they had come under pressure at the time to go to the IMF. And because of political calculations, they were simply buying time. So they presented the e-levy as a panacea to investors in order to buy a little time. Now it is obvious that the e-levy will not do anything for us. Look, in the month of May, they projected that they will make 471 million Ghana cities. That was a target for me. They got only 53.7 million Ghana cities, which is 11.4%. Mm. In the first week of June, they, were, they, they looked forward to getting about 150 million. They got only 7.1 7, 7, yeah. 7 million Ghana cities. Do you need a suit here to tell you that this is an abject failure and that it is going nowhere? Because people are avoiding the tax. But it could pick up. How Just as VAT picked what, up. No. No, you see, VAT affects... Else, else, VAT would have been buried VAT, in the Kumi Preko no, scheme, no, no. Kumi Preko demonstrations. What we did, what we did with But VAT, it came back. No, what we did and with, today it's above 17%. Wait, what we did with VAT is that when there was agitation, we withdrew it, we considered it, and brought it back. But the point is that VAT is almost inescapable. Because no matter what you do today, you are going to have to eat. You will drink water. If you buy sugar, if you buy rice, if you buy wache this morning, you will pay VAT. So it is not avoidable. But Momo or mobile money uh, what called transactions are avoidable. You can live without mobile money transactions. So for that reason, it is not predictable. There's no certainty with that. So we have said that, look, in addition to the problems that it is creating in terms of hardships, 
It is also reversing the gains that we've made in financial inclusion, because that is an avenue through which those who were not within the formal economic bracket got participation. And over the years, there's been some work to increase financial inclusion. There's been some work to uh, increase technology uptake in the way that our economy runs. This e-levy is having the effect of reversing the gains because people are pulling out. Only a day or two ago, GRE announced that they were now going to charge e-levy on vendor sims, you know, vendors, the sims that they use, they will be charged so that if you, prefer, you, you, you opt to pay money through a vendor, you will also pay the e-levy. I can, I'm certain that the vendors will find a clever way of avoiding that, or at the very least, they will close shop so that they do not have to bear the implications of this e-levy. Now, this will be detrimental to all the gains that we've made in financial inclusion. So even for the purposes of sustaining growth in financial inclusion, the e-levy has to go because it has proven not to be a sustainable tax. It's not a tax that will yield anything significant for us. And it's not a tax that will address the problems that we have. We will never say that we will impose tax. No government can live without it. Mm. So we will not be hypocritical. We will not mount platforms and recite slogans uh, from taxation to production. Meaningless, empty slogans that have yielded nothing. In, in terms of loans, one of the strategies we have to employ, uh, you have said that you will not support tag unconstitutional loans, that you're going to be blocking them in parliament. Mm -hmm. You also talk about the fact that you won't support any loans that have no purpose. But... <laughs> Every loan has a purpose. Well, first of all, we have said the exact Mr. former the exact, <laughs> deputy the exact, the, minister. The exact words that the former president used that we are not going to support non concessionary borrowing. Mm. Concessionary borrowing is borrowing that comes at very, very minimal cost and interest rate, sometimes 1.5%. But look at this 1 billion loan that they've gone for, instance. They've gone for, for instance. There's a 250 million component mm -hmm. coming from three banks Standard, Standard Chartered Bank, Rand Merchant Bank, and Standard Bank of South Africa. Now, the 250 million loan comes with insurance alone of 40.6 million. The insurance premium is 3.12%. If you calculate it, it amounts to $40.6 million mm. on the five-year term of the loan. You are going for 250 million, and yet you pay 40 million in insurance. Mm. The interest rate is 7.29%. And that That's works. That's almost a fifth. Absolutely. The and that works to 86 million. So if you put this together, when we pay the 250 million off, we have to pay an additional $127 million in cost. The reason why this is very expensive is that we don't have other options. And lending to Ghana has become a high-risk activity because we are high-risk distress, high-debt uh, distress. That means that- Are we a, there? Oh, yes. Oh, the IMF, World Bank, all of them have classified, we, we, have classified as we, such. We have a risk of distress. I have not we, no, seen, we have, in all my well, readings of the well, literature from the British well, I will send you. I have not send seen- you, High risk. I will I send you. There's a risk of debt distress, I will send but not you, high risk. I will send you even more literature. We are at high risk of debt distress. It has been so since 2019. It has always been exacerbated by worse mismanagement. But the point I'm making is that the, the reason why insurance premium and the costs are so high is that the lenders are hedging against the risk of lending to us because of our high likelihood of default. Now, if you come to the 750 million component of this one billion loan. We have not even spoken about insurance because they are concealing that. They've not given any information about that. But the interest payment alone will amount to 351 million. So if you put these two components together to form the one billion, we will pay one billion as the principal when it is due in about seven years. And then we'll pay an additional $438 million in cost. It is simply mind boggling. It is crazy. It does not make sense. And it is something that will impact negatively on our finances. Now, the interest for this loan will start accruing six months after it is signed. So in the next six months, you have to start paying interest. Now, already, we took 2025 and 2026 euro bonds. So they amount to $2.7 billion. Now, in the first 15 months of the next administration, starting from 2025, we have to cough up $2.7 billion, I beg your pardon, which is $24 billion to service two euro bonds that we took. If you add this 400 million cost from this one billion loan to it, we are talking $3 billion for a new government within a matter of 15 months. Indeed, in the, in the years between 2025 and 2029, we have to pay a total of 30 billion Ghana cities in debt, sorry, in amortization for four loan items alone. Forget about all the other loan items that we need to service and pay for. So this is not sustainable. And if we ever allow this kind of loan transaction to pass in parliament, it is going to worsen our situation as Ghanaians. 
That's why President Mama advised that, you know, one of the reasons that they've cited for going for this loan is that they need to improve our, what do you call it, reserve position, our international reserves. But everybody knows that if you have difficulty with balance of payments, you go to the IMF. They will give you concessionary balance of payment support, which comes at minimal cost, very, very low cost. Already they went for one when COVID struck. They went for balance of payment support mm. of $1 billion. It came at very, very minimal interest, sometimes 1%, which does not impose the kind of burden that this one will be imposing. Again, it is not every loan that is project specific. When you look at the loan, they will tell you that it is going to job creation, but they will not specify what that means. Often what they do is that they use it, they put it in a budget, and then they add it to our debt service uh, obligations. So you won't find the money in any specific project. So President Mama is saying that if you bring a loan, one, and it is not non-concessionary, in other words, the terms are not favorable and low. And so let, let's, let's quickly then, go back to that. If it's not non-concessionary. If, 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 if the loan is non-concessionary, mm -hmm. in other words, it's not a concessionary loan. We are not exactly. Supporting. And for so the other concessionary. Terms, a concessionary loan is a loan that comes in very favorable terms. Often, you get that from multilateral and bilateral sources. So it is very low. If you bring a commercial loan with this kind of cost implication for the taxpayer, mm. we will not be supporting it. If you bring a loan that is not project specific, in other words, you bring a loan that is not, say, going to finance a water project at Nkoko or build a hospital at Kawukudi, we are not supporting it. Mm. We are not supporting budget loans that have no specific purpose other than adding to government's chest to spend on non-priority areas. Mm -hmm. Now, this is necessary. What are those non-priority oh, areas? They have, they have all manner, you know, they have all manner of fanciful technologies that they use to describe this. Basically, they will add it to the money that they use to pay our debts. You can't borrow to pay debts. Otherwise, you are not going anywhere. Now, this is necessary as a way of checking government. You see, my brother, everybody knows, it is conventional wisdom that when you find yourself in a pit, you fall in a hole. You don't dig. You actually find a pedestal to st stand on to get out of the hole. But this government continues digging. Already, we owe 400 billion Ghana cities. This loan alone will add 8 billion Ghana cities to our debt portfolio in one fell swoop. So our debt will increase. In six months, the interest or debt service, servicing obligation around this loan will add to our already precarious debt service position, which we cannot even meet as I speak to you. So, so this so, is so, necessary so, let, let, to protect let, let, the taxpayer right. from a worsening economic situation. And I suppose because uh, your, your, well, your party, your administration, former administration, is going to come back into power. Oh, so certainly. I guess, in a way, you're trying to forestall a situation where when you come back, the, econ the economy will be in a very bad state. You forget about the NDC is that, is see, that forget, forget about the uh, No, no, no. I, we no, we, forget, we forget get to that. Oh, it is true. We have absolutely every intention of coming back. There's no, we've not hidden it at all. And indeed, we'll be starting a frontal campaign to do that. But the point is that... And if no, you inherit an economy that, of you, course, that we, you claim we is, certainly, is bad, we what, certainly do not what are the measures inherit, you're going to be implementing? We certainly do not want to inherit a bad economy. Indeed, no government deserves that. That you is why... You claim it that is why, bad. But it is if bad. If you inherit it, it what, what will you do? If, if we inherit it, all the things we are saying, we will, that phase structure is something we will pursue. And we've made it very, very clear. We've not hidden it. We will ensure that we align expenditure with revenue. We are not going to engage in the reckless expenditure that is... Certainly, the, our president will not be flying in 20... 1,000 euro an hour uh, jets, when we have a presidential jet sitting here, we will not be devoting hundreds of millions of dollars to We're talking 5,000 an hour and the rest. Yeah, but you cannot be. Is, Look, you know, the I mean, president can go commercial. Even if he flies first class, the most it will cost us will be 6,000. Just one of $6,000 for the return flight. But if he hires a 20,000 euro an hour jet, it means that 20,000 every hour, for as long as the president continues to maintain use of that jet. So we are in deep trouble. Our president will not behave that way. We will not spend hundreds of millions of dollars on fanciful projects that have no financial necessity and any tangible benefits for the people. We are not going to waste money on projects that are poorly thought through. Every single expenditure we make will be aligned to the interest. Now that you of talk a, a lot about money, expenditure, and projects, and all mm. of that, what is your take on the National Cathedral, for example? Well, and we, we, oh, hold on. We're sure. expending a lot of money in that. I mean, per some estimates that we've had here, when you add what Okujatua Blackwa has alleged will go into compensation, about sure. 100 million. When you add what we've paid to David Ajay, about 22 million. When you add the, the actual figure for the construction of, of uh, the cathedral and other you know, ancillary you know, issues, we're looking at $547 million. If, if, if the cathedral is completed, 
and should your administration come to power? Should. What are you going to do? Yesterday, I interacted with Dr. Abu Sakara Foster. He said we should turn it into a university for governors, for parliamentarians and others. Well, others, and others too have what, said. What, 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 others, what, what others, would you do with it? Others have said that it can also be turned into a specialist hospital for children or a specialist hospital for, for well, the, the design wouldn't fit that. Oh, you can always... Or type. But the point is this. I think that as for those ones, you can always have a debate over it. But the point is that I'm a Christian just like anybody. But I can assure you that I do not lend support to this sort of expenditure. If Christians decide that they will put up an edifice like that, and Christians have shown capacity to build mega, mega structures across the length and breadth of this our country. If they decide that they want to build a cathedral and they want help from government by way of land or some form of facilitation, I don't think that anybody will quarrel with it because nobody has quarreled with all the mega cathedrals that Christians have built across the length and breadth of this country. But a, a country with the sort of problems that we have, a country that cannot pay 97 pesos per head for children to be fed once in a day, a country that owes Ghanaian businesses to the tune of 30 billion Ghana cities, so that their businesses are collapsing and they are having to dismiss or send employees home. A country that cannot print textbooks for basic school pupils for three years. A country where students still sit under trees to receive instruction, cannot spend $400 million on a cathedral. I'm not sure there's any religious justification for this. Because I've always asked the question, I don't know of one priest who would rather starve his children and go and pay collection at church? The first responsibility that this government has to the people of Ghana is to ensure that they have a better life, is to ensure that the economy is managed well. If you have not been able to do that, sometimes people get employed in the public sector and for months they have not received even a single salary. As I speak to you, national service personnel are still owed allowances. The allowances for teach, teaching and nursing trainees are still in arrears. NAPCO employees, people who were unemployed and who were promised jobs, have worked for three years, they've been sent home, and for several months have not been paid. How are they supposed to survive? You cannot meet this because of your rigidities, and yet you want to spend $400 million on a cathedral. I cannot lend support to that, despite my abiding faith in Christianity. And so I am very clear. There are those even in our party who hold a slightly contrary view. But I think that we need to be very clear on Can this. they complete the cathedral? From what I'm seeing, can, can, can from what I'm seeing, complete the from what I'm seeing, even if the, this government wanted to, they cannot because they don't have the money. And again, you have to question the judgment. What, 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 if, if they don't uh, complete the, the, the cathedral, what would that mean for us in terms yeah, of? It would be a terrible waste. Mm. Indeed, the land on which that cathedral is situated doesn't cost anything less than 120 million Ghana cities because where it is, it's prime land. It's 14 acres. Mm. That is not less than 120 million Ghana cities. The judges' so quarters, the judges companies, quarters that we the companies uh, that we have to be compensated for. The scholarship secretary. It was completely unnecessary. Government was not ready. They didn't have a dedicated funding line. They didn't have anything. And yet they said, who builds? Even the Bible stipulates that before you build, you right, must count I see the where cost. You're going. Right. Before you build, you must count the cost. So, so you don't how start do you, and stop. How do you start a project when you've not counted the cost? We were told that it will cost $100 million. Then it jumped to 200 Then it came to 300 It came to 300 Now we are told it's $400 million. Look at all the procurement violations and infractions, the underhand dealings, the sleaze, the lack of transparency, the opacity, the, the darkness, the shadowy nature of some of the transactions, the inflated figures paid to the architects, as Imani and other civil society organizations have proven uh, in, in, in past days. So there's everything wrong with building a cathedral, at least to the extent that it is funded by this. But it still has a lot of support. In fact, I've cited documents pointing course. to the fact that there's a week of, you know, uh, but you see, prayer, that, that fasting, is why, and raising of funds and all that. Christians, Ghanaians are contributing no, to see, the kitty. Christians, About 31 million Ghana Christians, cities have been raised. Christians have a right to build any number of cathedrals they want. So I'm not going to quarrel with any religious organization that wants to build a cathedral. So they are entitled, and I wish them well, in the effort to mobilize resources to do this. But it must not be done at the expense of the public purse because we simply do not have the money for it. That has been my position from day one. And that position has not changed since then. Indeed, yesterday I, I listened to uh, Professor Opoku Unines' uh, press conference where he said that they had raised up to 31 million Ghana cities. Great, more grease to their elbow. Let them raise more if they can. And if they are able to build it, that is fine. But the public or the Republic of Ghana should not have to pay a dime 
for this, especially at a time. I remember engaging some members of parliament on the majority side, yeah. uh, typically among them, the member of parliament um, for second D, I think, uh, Andre Japamesa, who mm -hmm. says, if it were left to him, uh, first of all, Akufuado is not going to, our president is not going to will the cathedral to his children, he says. And that if it were left to him, we should even foot the entire bill. Well, it has been corroborated by some other members of well, parliament. Well, Pamesa is a deputy side. minister in Akufuado's government. He dares He's not contradict He's a deputy energy him. minister. He dares not contradict him. He, he has a mind of his own. Well, the day, he, the day he expresses disagreement with his boss, the president on the cathedral, that will be the day he is removed from office. So I'm not sure that if you want to form a view, an objective view. How, how can you say that categorically? Oh, but why? Who, who survives disagreement with Akufuado? You can ask Bwache Jaku for the consequences of disagreeing with him. You can ask what happened to Kabne Japan and Paul Afoku and Co, even within his party. So he's not a man who tolerates dissent, certainly not within his party and not within government. But the point I'm making is that support for the cathedral by a member of the Akufuado government is simply like saying that a dog barks. You understand me? It is obvious. It is, it is a given. It doesn't mean anything. But I think that when we engage in rational, objective analysis of national issues, everybody knows what is right. A majority of Ghanaian Christians are opposed to public funding of the cathedral. They, they are not opposed to the idea of a cathedral. I don't think they should, to the extent that it is funded by Christians through their churches. That is fine. If public-spirited individuals want to contribute, they are entitled to do so. They are free to do what they want. With okay. But the public right. person must be used judiciously. So, so, so per the what president you're saying, actually promised I mean, mm. to use the public press. He said he will protect the public press. At this moment, the public press has been left bare and is being subject to systematic abuse. So on one, a daily of, basis. One, one of the options would be, like you're saying, maybe mm -hmm. to turn it into a hospital. Like of course, you, people like have said, said for instance, if, if, look, if, the, if the, the Republic of Ghana has money, $400 million, it would be wiser to invest it in a public facility that has direct benefits. But a few yards from the site of the National Cathedral, it's a $250 million hospital, rich, which is serving a tangible purpose. When you go there today, you will see people receiving health care, first class health care. Decide for yourself who you would hand a country over to. A man who gets $250 million invests in a world class hospital that is delivering world class health services to Ghanaians. Or another one who wants to spend it on a cathedral. All right. That does not have a tangible to, 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 to cap off the conversation, I think we've sure. addressed all the economic angles and what the way forward would be. So basically, we should go to the IMF, right? Well, I think it's, it's not like the government has a choice between going to the IMF and doing something else. There's no something else do, to do. Do you feel, do you feel uh, very soon maybe this administration's hand would be tied and they would have to go to the IMF? I won't be surprised if in the next few days we hear that they have made the necessary approaches to the IMF. Because, like I said, they you don't have be surprised if in the I next few days... I, I will not be surprised if in the next few days that call is made. Because the point I'm making is that it's not like they have a choice between A and B. They don't have a choice between the IMF and something else. There's no something else to be had. There's only the IMF and something that needs to be done about our debt. Those are the only two things they need to do. And you see, incidentally, both actions are interrelated. Our creditors will not tolerate any discussions that are not led by the IMF with regards to doing something about our debt in terms of rescheduling our interest payments, what have you. The IMF too will not touch us with the long pool if they have the indication that our debt is not sustainable. So they, they are likely to ask us as part of their prior actions to do something about our debt. But once investors get word that we are in touch with the IMF and there's a likelihood that we'll go under a program, they'll be willing to listen to us. So the government must stop the death rate. There's no point in political posturing. There's no disgrace in going to the IMF. It is the MPP itself that made it look like Egypt has gone to the IMF. Right. The leaders in Egypt don't feel disgrace. Right. They don't feel ashamed. Right. They've True. gone there. True. Egypt is a much better country than Ghana in terms of economic profile. Their economic indicators are much better than ours. They are doing mega, they are building new cities. And yet they've gone to the IMF. But you look at a country and that is And it wouldn't be the first time. Actually. There wouldn't be the We have gone to the IMF 16 times prior to this one, if we ever go. You understand me? So it is nothing new. We are right. in any event, whether you go to the IMF or not, every year they come here to sit down. Indeed, I think in about a month or two ago, they were here to do Article 4 consultations. Right. That simply means right. that we opened up our books for them to assess whether we're on the right path. And they told us point blank that we're not on the right path. So we have a running engagement with the IMF already. Just that now we have a peculiar problem that requires peculiar prescriptions that the IMF can help with. So let the president make the call and stop the district. All right.
Uh, just to cap off the conversation, if you can do this in a minute for sure. me, I'd be very grateful. Like you can see in today's uh, Finder newspaper, 29 rioters to face court on Monday as police commit to arrest all other uh, perpetrators. You know the 29 I'm, sure, I'm sure. speaking about sure. on the back of the Arise Ghana uh, demonstration. What is your take in just about a minute on, on the happenings on day one, especially the posturing of the demonstrators uh, versus the police and the arrest Look, of these I people? I saw gory pictures of demonstrators who had been assaulted, some with horrific injuries. I saw a man whose eyeballs had virtually been scooped out. I suspect that he will lose that eye. He will lose visibility in that eye. It's a terrible reflection on policing. Look, the, the, the inclination of the Ghana Police Service should be to offer service to the public. The fact that we are protesting against a government does not mean that you need to rally to that government's defense. It is not your place to do so. So I was shocked. So you can actually expatiate on this a bit. We've been given a little more Great. breathing so, time. So, so you can I, go was, ahead. I was surprised. Maybe you can share your thoughts on the demonstration yes. day. So I was surprised and, and, when within a few minutes of the IGP's address that they should be peaceful and respectful of the demonstrators, things descended into chaos. And I did not expect that to happen. I thought that we had overcome that as a country. We had. Come, Which is what? Overcome what exactly? In terms of assaulting and brutalizing demonstrators. But you saw what the demonstrators did. No, but you see, the point is that. Why you would, saw what the demonstrators see, did. You see, I, I will not justify any. One of the police officers was pictured, and it has gone wide. I see. When you, a, a photo yeah. from the Ghana Broadcasting. When you, when you compare. No, 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 just hold it. Yeah. And a lot of people misunderstood. But, but guess what? Uh -huh. Our was reporter was, he was right there. He was returning a story. And the point is that you have to ask yourself. I mean, it, it, it wasn't professional to do that, but, yeah. but, but, but you know the human the element. Point. They, they threw see, them. No, at him. See, that is the point. The, the, you see, it is not the place of leaders of demonstrations to maintain law and order. It is the police. The reason why they are there is to maintain law and order, to ensure that if anybody behaved outside of the ambit of the law, they are dealt with. So your, your first inclination is not to assault demonstrators, even if you think that they are undermining law and order. Your first inclination is to bring it under control and not to inflict horrific injuries on them. So the police must bear responsibility and they must be criticized severely for mishandling and bangling what should have been a straightforward act of maintaining law and order. So, so you, you, the you lay the blame squarely at the doorstep is, yeah, of look, the police? The police has far too much experience in this. I am a serial mm -hmm. demonstrator. I have organized demonstration in conjunction with my colleagues in the CGA. And the police's posture to every demonstration is that they must do something to undermine it because they do not want the venting against the government of the day. That posture that our police has, that somehow is, they are answering. Is that a posture? Since you oh, yes. refer to the police, yes, I, is that a posture that has also existed course, under your administration? Since, since time memorial. I okay. will not be hypocritical. It's good you put it that way. I will not be hypocritical and, 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 and create the impression that it's a new development. But the police is under the impression that they must preserve government's interests at all times. Maybe, is, maybe it's also why some people are saying that, look, uh, wean, wean those powers I agree. off the, I agree. the executive but president. I agree. Because once the president is, and, and once the police service is a part of I the agree. executive, I agree. these things will Some have even gone happen. ahead to call for an independent police commission that supervises. Right the activities of the police, so that they have the necessary independence to act. But at the moment, what we have is a service. In, indeed, the entire security service is tuned to ensure that the regime survives instead of the nation surviving. So any protestation, any demonstration, any act that appears to be detrimental to the interest of the regime, breaks them, draws them into action to protect the interests of the regime. That is why their first inclination is to oppose every proposal for a demonstration. Every time they have to go to court, to seek to either alter the time or the but, route but, of the demonstration. But, but, but some of but, the requests, some mm -hmm. of the requests are, uh, to, to, for lack of a better word, preposterous. I mean, when you say you want to go on a demonstration and you want to go with your own arm to that, that's it, all of that, that, I mean, of course. It, so there it, it are those absurd. So now <laughs> there's unanimity. When that matter broke, there was unanimity. There was consensus within Ghanaian society that that was absurd. There was no way that it could be tolerated. So people can tell when things are done in a manner that does not reflect reason mm. or, or sound judgment. So the police, and when you want to demonstrate so that night, you want to picket the Jubilee it. House there's at night. Wrong with it. I mean, looking at the circumstances, what circumstances? Look, look, look at what they're saying. That look Why? in the sub region, so are, no. at night you want to do that no. <laughs> with, a threat, with, with a threat of that, you know, everything me, we know. They are telling me that the police service of Ghana cannot provide security at night. So today, if there's an emergency at multimedia at night, the police cannot rush here and provide you security. I would, I, I beg to differ. They have capacity to do it. They simply do not want the spectacle because they thought it to be embarrassing to government. Otherwise, I don't see what the, if somebody wants to sit at a particular position, a place, for 10 days continuous. What is the police's business? To the extent that it does not disrupt regular activity. In any event, there's some room for disruption during demonstrations. I have been to capitals of this world. I've been to New York, London, where impromptu demonstrations have been held. 
And within the spell of a moment, a road that was free had been blocked so that demonstrators could have access and demonstrate. There have been demonstrations that have been staged for days on end. So the Ghana Police Service must change their posture. They must change their outlook and reflect one that is serving the public, not the government. If we got that right, I don't think we'll have some of these problems. But I think that despite the inauspicious start, the demonstration peaked on the second day. Mm. I think that people showed revulsion. Because anger. on the first day, one of the things that uh, many people said was, look, the, the very reason the people had hit the streets mm -hmm. was lost. Because in, in, it was in not the sure chaos that, that the media would generated. focus on the chaos and the altercations that ensued. But to the credit of the organizers, they were able to refocus mm. the purpose for the demonstration. And people who felt that they identified with the principles that the organizers were espousing came out in their numbers and participated, and it went peacefully. So you want to ask, what happened on the first day? How is it that the Ghana Police Service, within a matter of 24 hours, is able to change posture, such that they are more accommodating, more tolerant and respectful of the rights of demonstrators? And speaking the speaking, speaking of tolerance, yeah. um, do you feel, uh, and, and some of you have alleged, I want to know what you're thinking is, this, this administration is so intolerant that it is preventing people from practicing or yes. exercising a genuinely legal... Yes. Right, which is to demonstrate. I mean, I've heard the likes of, on the back of some of these happenings, Professor Chris Yening has been speaking. Yeah. He says, look, I could criticize another former administration and sleep, you know, heartily. Yeah. Uh, but and now, Professor Yening is not necessarily a lover of the NDC. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. And for him to be able to testify in such glowing terms about the NDC administration, it's a clear indication that something has changed. Indeed, in the last few weeks, we have been bombarded with one well, What has changed? One report after the other about clear deterioration in media uh, freedoms, clear deterioration in human rights standards, clear deterioration in the space, the political space, which have been superintended by President Akufuado. His government has not been disposed to allow him for free expression. Indeed, I am aware of journalists who live in fear for their practice. I know of instances where journalists have published stories and government officials have zoomed in to intimidate them to disclose their sources. With all manner of threats dangling around them. I don't think that it is proper. And it is regrettable that after 30 years of continuous democratic practice, we've come to a juncture where journalists have to look over their shoulder. And you are in the media. I'm sure you've, you feel the criticism that is leveled against you people all the time, that you appear to be a bit more tolerant of this administration than you were of the previous one. There may be good reasons for that posture, because they say self-preservation is the first principle of life. So you do not want to incur the wrath of a government. You see, they may not do that, for, they may not bring security agents here to drag you uh, into jail or behind bars. But they may use other ways to suppress you. You have instances where journalists reveal information. Granted, that the information they put out is false. But why do you arrest a journalist and seek to imprison him because he stole a lie, if we were to speak bluntly? Where in this world does that happen? Where in the democratic world? That is, does this happen? When we do know that there's recourse to civil action to seek redress if you feel hard done by, by something that has been reported about you. But the standards have so fallen. The space has been emasculated. Political opponents, media practitioners, civil society operatives have come under direct attack from this government. And it shocks many people. But it doesn't shock me because President Kufadi showed signs of it when he was opposition. I spoke to you about Kwabna Japan. I mean, there's a famous saying that I repeat everywhere I go. You see, when a man catches a tortoise and plucks feathers from it, the back of a tortoise, what do you expect the man to do when he lays hands on a chicken? So when the man was... The tortoise doesn't have feathers. Yes, so it is only... Uh, I, I get it. It's figurative. Exactly. It's figurative. <coughs> so if he is able to deal with his own in the harsh terms that he dealt with Kabbalah Japan and Afuko, there were times when tax militants, loyal to him, went to lock up Afuko's office, dragged out Paul Afuko from his office. We saw how the head, headquarters of the MPP became the staging post of violent confrontations over disagreements with Akufuado's policies internally. If the man was able to do that, what did you expect him to do when he became commander-in-chief of the armed forces and he had all this power? We went to elections in 2020. Eight people were gunned down, gunned down as we speak. Not a finger has been raised by the president on this matter. And those eight people have died in vain. There's nothing that has been done to ensure that justice is sought for their loss of their lives and the pain and suffering that their family have gone through. So clearly, President Kufuado on all fronts has not lived up to expectation. Oh. He has disappointed even his most ardent supporters. I have been a critic of him since I memorial. But even I have been shocked at the level of underperformance that he's displayed. I don't think that this is right. And I think that 
the Leo Petrovic party deserves to be booted out of office at the earliest opportunity in 2024 so that we get a government that is more adherent and tolerant of the people of Ghana, that is more respectful of the views of the people, and that has an agenda to rebuild after the complete demolition exercise that the Akufuado Baumia government has performed right. on the foundations that were. I, I, I think this. Uh, uh, this time, we can actually say that this will be the very final uh, bid. Absolutely. And, and I had to bring it in. Of course, uh, today is not a holiday. Yes. It has changed. Yes. But today would have been, in the past, what we would call Republic yeah. uh, Day. And um, this would be because it was in 1960. So this would be, what, the 62nd yeah. uh, Republic Day. What's your quick reflection on Ghana? See, first of all, uh, after 62 yesterday, years. Yesterday, I recall having Republic. to Google to find out whether today is holiday or not, because I was not certain. But you see, it is a reflection of the whimsical government of President Kufado. This overriding need to change everything, rename things, reconfigure things. What was wrong with the celebration of Republic Day as a holiday that necessitated its, its change into a commemorative day instead of a holiday? What was wrong with it? This is a key milestone in our national history. Because up until then, the head of state of Ghana was a foreigner, the Queen of England. And we attained complete independence, such that we now had our own executive president. It is a significant day. Perhaps, apart from the Independence Day, this is the this second is most, most significant, significant day in terms of our nation's history. And yet, President Kufadu felt that he had to be scrapped. And in his stead, brought in a 4th August celebration, which only marks the day that the UGCC, which is a progenitor of the MPP, was formed. Parochial, partisan, sectarian interest over the national interest, because the president's father and his uncle were within that group. We cannot have governance run that way. You see, when the mandate of the people of Ghana and resources are entrusted to you, you don't use it to further your own familial interests. So you want to honor your father and your uncle by putting in place a date that reflects your party's history. And you superimpose that on the nation and scrap a holiday that all of us can identify with. I would advocate strongly any day that the NEC comes to power that that 4th August date must be scrapped. It holds no significance mm. for our country beyond. And NPP Republic Day Syria. restored? Republic Day must be restored because it's an important celebration. I am, not you, a, I am not necessarily a fan of many holidays. But at least if we're going to have holidays, they must carry meaning for the people of this country, not sectarian and partisan interest as President Akufuado has pursued. Mm. Felix Wachio uh, Fosu, thank you for joining us in the, the studio. Thank you for doing us the honors, uh, coming and sharing your thoughts the pleasure uh, is all with mine. us. And um, we wish you the very best. Of course, a, a former deputy minister on both fronts, the information front and the communications uh, front. He joined us for this all important uh, conversation. Uh, I'll be sharing with you my blunt thoughts uh, shortly, but uh, let's take a breather, shall we? Awake is. Uh, Premium purified uh, water treated through a strict purification process to ensure that every bottle on the market refreshes you better. We have the perfect sizes for every occasion. 330 500ml bottles to fit your pockets and bags, 750ml for the heavy drinkers, and 1.5 litres for those who always want more. But if you want more, we have also introduced our special 19-litre jars for offices and homes. Now, you just need to stay awake with Awake Purified Water uh, wherever you go. So come on, grab your bottle of Awake Water and get quality hydration. Awake Purified Drinking Water, one for life. Remember, for every bottle you purchase, an amount is donated to the National Cardiothoracic Center. That is heartwarming for me. It's produced by Casa Preco. For bulk purchases, just call 0262 351 Two, five, one. And just so you know, that VAT returns are due for submission on the last working day of every month. Failure to submit returns attracts a penalty. Don't say we didn't tell you. Now, let's, let's talk about renting to your own, your own facility, whether it's two, three, or four bedroom house or beachfront villa in the new Accra city. Cities and habitats rent to own at a price you can afford and at a pace you can easily pay. Visit www newacra.city for more details or call or WhatsApp the following numbers 0555 530 300 or 0577 911 101 or 0557 054 635. The Plan Cities Extension Project shaping Ghana's urban future. Do stay with us after the break. I'll be sharing with you my blunt uh, thoughts this Friday morning like I've done over the last three weeks and today I'm going to be sharing my thoughts on missing the industrialization boat, the curious case of Ghana. I'll be back after the break.